All right, thank you everyone. Um, thank you for attending today's UNC Charlotte School of Data Science webinar on the data and analytics in the intelligence community in a panel session. So I appreciate your attendance today and we have a great uh, panel for uh, the, this discussion and we'll introduce that in a minute. But first I wanted to introduce the School of Data Science. Um, we were established in January of 2020. We evolved out of the Data Science Initiative and we are the first School of Data Science in the in the Carolinas and third in the nation. Uh, so we are very happy to be moving and, and forming the School of Data Science. We are actually made up of three, two master's degrees and an undergraduate now. Uh, we have an undergraduate degree that launched this fall. Uh, we have about 340 total students. Uh, you know, we are made up of four colleges. So the colleges of Health and Human Service, the College of Computing and Informatics, the College of Business and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So we are a very interdisciplinary program and really aspire to teach the next generation of, of data scientists and, and data, data literate uh, people for, the, for Charlotte and the North Carolina area, as well as the country. Uh, we were named an inspiring STEM program and uh, we were a finalist for the NC Tech Association. Unfortunately, the town of Cary beat us out for, the, uh, for the actually winning that last night, um, but that's very good. Uh, congratulations to the town of Cary, but we are uh, a, doing very well as the school. And then finally, just to thank our sponsors for this webinar series, Bank of America, Duke Energy, Lowe's Corporation, and SIA Partners. They have provided a lot of, lot of support to the School of Data Science over the years and in this particular webinar series. And we just want to make sure to thank those uh, sponsors of this, of this series of webinars. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and we will turn it over to Jim Walsh. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jim Walsh. I'm a professor of political science at UNC Charlotte, and I am the director of the university's Intelligence Community Center for Academic Excellence. Uh, I'll be moderating today's talks. So um, we're going to hear from three speakers who I'll introduce in a moment. Let me just give a little bit of a framework for how things will unfold. So each of the speakers is going to talk about our topic for today for about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, that should leave us maybe 15 minutes for question and answer. Uh, so if you have questions, I'd encourage you to just post them in the chat box. Um, you can do that towards the end, like during the Q&A session or as you're listening to the speakers. And I'll kind of collect them and pose them to the speakers after they've each had a chance to talk. We're formally ending at, at, at 1 p.m. So um, if you can stay that long, that's great. If you need to, um, if the speakers have agreed to hang around a bit later after that. Uh, particularly to answer questions from students about things like careers in the intelligence community um, and stuff like that. I know we have a lot of our students uh, here today, so I'm, I'm really glad to see that as well. Okay, so let me quickly introduce our three speakers and then turn it over to them. Uh, our first speaker is Lieutenant General Bob Ashley. He's retired as the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. He, before that, he served as the Army's Deputy Chief of Staff, G2 where he was a senior advisor to the Secretary of the Army and Army Chief of Staff for all aspects of intelligence, counterintelligence, and security. Our second speaker is Dr. Barbara Stevens, who served at the Central Intelligence Agency for 35 years, uh, where she built and directed complex data science programs. In addition to that, she uses her platform as an agency leader to advocate for the recruitment and retention of women in, and diversity in highly technical fields. She has strong ties to academia, having served as the CIA's top leader to the University of New Mexico as the data science ambassador to the Institute for Advanced Analytics at North Carolina State. And our third speaker is Brad Dreyer, uh, who's the business operations strategy and technology executive and COO for global, global corporate security at Bank of America. Brad and his team support corporate security through operational excellence, strategic planning and project management. Okay, great. So those are our three uh, speakers. We have a sort of interesting array of speakers with military intelligence and private sector backgrounds. Uh, Bob has agreed to speak first, so I'll turn it over to him. Hey, Jim, thanks. And uh, thanks for doing to Charlotte and everybody that's participating today. And by thumbs up, I'll assume I got good, uh, good audio. All right, so we're tracking. Hey, for all the students that have dialed in today, thanks for what you do. Um, I cannot tell you as, as a recipient of the education that you're undergoing right now, how critical what you do and what you're learning is 
related to national security. I know Dr. Stevens will hit that and then we'll hear, we'll hear a little bit on the commercial sector. What I wanted to talk to you about for about 10 minutes is context. So you have all these technologies and these capabilities, but what's the context in which they're applied? What's the operational environment in which this is being used to leverage and help us in terms of national security? So I, I think that's where I kind of wanted to start uh, the discussions. I'll kind of give you a, a kind of a chapeau, but a couple little vignettes, a little bit of historical context and some things to think about. And I know Dr. Stevens and, uh, and we'll, we'll go into a little more detail in terms of the, the Intel strategy. So let me talk a little bit about, for me, context. There's a number of documents uh, that frame our national security strategy, but one that is uh, really germane to me is I look at how do I support the national defense strategy? And in case the one that was pinned by Secretary Mattis a couple of years ago in 2018, the, the, the lexicon has really come out of that national defense strategy is the return to great power competition. And defined in with, within the NDS is, you know, if you've worked with General Mattis, which I have in the past as his intel officer, you know, he always starts off with what's the problem we're trying to solve? And so if you look at the national defense strategy, the return to great power competition, the problem that we're trying to solve is that our lead uh, in terms of military capabilities is atrophy. It's, it's getting smaller. And really where we were at the fall of the wall uh, in 89, the demise of the Soviet Union, the unipolar moment that's kind of existed for a little over a decade now is gone. And so we're in this period of rapid change, rapid interaction, incredible developments in technology and data and how that impacts uh, national security. So to give you just a quick example, just think about Vietnam in the 60s. So 1963, and for the students, you guys are obviously too young to remember that. I would tell you, go Google um, self-emulation Vietnam Buddhist monks, and you'll see a picture from 1963 where a Buddhist monk in protest to the Diem government engages in an act of self-emulation, makes the cover of Time magazine, the Australian guy that took a picture of it gets a Pulitzer Prize, but nothing substantially changes. Fast forward, 2010, 2011, you get a vegetable vendor named Mohamed Bouazizi engages in the same act of self emulation in Tunisia. And then really a lot of people talk about that as being the spark that launched the Arab Spring. You look at Twitter, social media, what took place in Cairo and Tahrir Square, and really what the, the conflict that is still going on in Syria. So look at that speed of interaction because of the interconnectedness of what's taking place now. So let me do a little bit of uh, history as well. So let's go back to the Peloponnesian War. So when you think about that return of great power competition, you know, practitioners like Mattis and others will talk about the nature and the character of war. And what they'll do is they'll go back to Thucydides. So when Thucydides wrote about the Peloponnesian War, he wrote about a thing called the Thucydides Trap. And that's when you have a reigning and a rising power. In this case, the reigning power is Sparta, the rising power is Athens. And the Thucydides trap is written around the premise that when you have a rising power and a reigning power, it's inevitably going to go to conflict. One of the things Thucydides wrote about was the nature of war. He said it's about fear, honor, and, or, and interests, and that that's immutable. It does not change. But he says the character of war is constantly changing, and that's what we see. And then think about data. Think about information. Think about AI, machine learning, quantum, all of those capabilities, all that technology that is just being thrust upon us, not only for nations, but na for non-nation states that get access to a lot of that stuff because the bar is pretty low. So that's what we face right now is with just as rapid changing in the character of war. And from a military standpoint, you know, the, the, the six deployments that I have to Iraq and Afghanistan, the only thing that was really contested in the domains we talk about war fighting domains was the ground. But now we look at cyber, maritime, air, space, all of these domains with the return of great power competition are potentially, and many are, going to be contested. And that's something that we have to, to face. The other part is think about the national instruments of power. We think about diplomatic information, military and economic. Now, my job is to be really, really deep on the M in dime, but I can't ignore the other instruments of power. Matter of fact, I provide huge support to diplomatic efforts in terms of what we do from the Defense Department, because not everything leads with the M. And so we have a huge role in supporting diplomacy information and really understanding economics. And so as I think about that going ahead, we play in all of that. 
And then when you think about big data and the information is available, then it gets into things like indications and warning. Indications and warning across the gamut, whether it be for an understanding of the potential for kinetics or you know combat operations, or just disinformation. You know, is the information that I'm seeing true, or am I seeing a maneuver by a particular competitor? And is that really what's taking place on the ground? And so that kind of information, that kind of big data, as it gets into helping us, one, prevent strategic surprise is absolutely critical. But my job, not only in helping prevent strategic surprise, is helping senior leaders have decision advantage. In other words, they've got to be able to see problems, understand them, and be able to make decisions and take action before the things become more problematic. I'll give you a, a simple example. Let's say the Chinese were thinking about opening a port in a Pacific nation. Now, if I get insights that's getting ready to take place, I really want to make sure that I can get to the State Department and others so that they can impact that decision before the ink is dry on that contract where the Chinese may be thinking, hey, look, I want to open a port, pick your Pacific island because you know, the Chinese start thinking about that in the context of positional advantage as they start putting, you know, I don't want to say if you're familiar with the Go game, as they start putting their rocks out uh, on the global game of Go. And for us, you know, it's really a combination of publicly available information and then really kind of that pristine classified information that we get access to. All of that comes together with some very sophisticated tools to give us decision advantage. And a lot of times, you know, decision leaders are going to say there's so much information out there, so much disparate information. How do I see things that are maneuvering? And then, you know, the other examples, think back to 1914. Imagine if you had the data and the AI tools today. Could you have seen those disparate moves that were taking place? And could you have prevented um, really what was kind of the way we backed into World War I? And so when I think about data analytics in the IC, it's got to really be in context. And so one of the things, you know, in, in this day and age, you, you talk about the politicization of intelligence. And I was having a conversation with a really good friend of mine and really a mentor over in the DNI. And he said, you know, for the longest time, I thought I was in the intelligence business. And he kind of captured, he says, you know what I'm really in? He goes, I'm in the trust business. And he goes, that's the value proposition that the intelligence community has with the nation, with the senior leaders is trust. And so when you think about data, you think about information. So how do we construct that in such a way that we build trust? And then there's really kind of three legs to that for the IC that I'd ask you to think about. One is service to nation, right? And if you've been following Chairman Milley uh, through the elections and his comments, you know, he says, hey, look, you know, when we raise our right hand, service to the nation, it's about, it's not about a king, it's not about a queen, it's not about a leader, it's not about an individual. And, you know, this is kind of civics 101, right? It's about an idea. It's about the Constitution. So that that trust from the IC stems from our service to nation. Second part, agnostic. People are going to go into senior leaders and they're going to look for decisions and they're going to be kind of weighing, you know, toward decisions that and outcomes that they would desire. We inform policy. We don't make decisions. We are not the deciders. Now, that's not to say that, you know, Bob Ashley as a person doesn't have a certain degree of interest in an outcome or decision, but I'm agnostic. What I do is I present the information as best I can so that they can be informed when they make those policy decisions. And then the last part is transparency, and that transparency gets to the crux of part of what we're going to talk about today in the data. So when I provide an assessment, it's based on information that I have, right? So I'm going to tell you that it's either low, medium, or I have high confidence. And then I'm going to tell you about the sourcing. I'm going to tell you about the background. I'm going to tell you about how I collected that. It may be human intelligence where I got it from a source, and I'm going to tell you how much I trust that source and how they reported in the past. It may be signals intelligence. So you, you put all of those things together, I have to unpack transparency in terms of the confidence level. And so think about that in terms of artificial intelligence or an algorithm. You can't just go, well, you know, it's, it's a magic black box and it kind of spits out an answer. I need you to unpack the algorithm. I need to know how you trained it. And do I have a high level of confidence in how you trained that algorithm to get me to, you know, kind of the answer where I can go to a senior leader and kind of tell them this is how we got it. And so that's kind of the trust proposition or, you know, how I look at the IC in terms of what's our value proposition with senior leaders. It's really about that kind of transparency. Um, and so, you know, that's integral to our, to our trade craft. 
And so let me kind of close out when somebody says, hey, what keeps you up at night? Well, there's a lot of things that keep me up at night. But the biggest one is, you know, really, it's kind of the Internet of Things. It's the interconnectedness of cyber, of the Internet, of information. You know, the fact that you can hack in and shut down a tank. You can hack my, you know, my refrigerator and, and turn the ice maker on. So it's those kinds of things. As you think about critical infrastructure, and then the other part is just what we've gone through with an election, uh, what the uh, FBI has done, what Cybercom and NSA has done to make sure that you understand, you know, the, the, the veracity of the information that underpins what's taking place, what's happening in the news media. Um, I sat a panel not too long ago with the director of NSA and Cybercom, General Nakasone, and he said, what's your, and one of the questions that was asked was, what concerned you the most? And he said, it's disinformation. And so it's understanding that veracity and the data of what we have to deal with, which spans the gamut of from prior to conflict in the diplomatic sphere into military, but it goes across diplomatic information, military economics, it touches everything. And so that's absolutely critical to what we do is that trust and understanding what underpins the tradecraft, but what's the problem we're trying to solve, which is to keep our military advantage uh, and our positional advantage as we think about great power competition. And with that, um, I will turn it over to Barbara. Thank you, Bob, and thank you to uh, UNC Charlotte for setting this up. And um, I have to say that I am really looking forward to the question and answer session because I love talking to students about opportunities in the intelligence community and the, and the fascinating the careers that you can have doing data analytics in the IC. But I'm going to step back and talk a little bit, um, a little bit in the way that General Ashley did, sort of about the, the sort of framework that we're dealing with today. I want to start by saying the role of intelligence, whether it's providing information or identifying options for the policymaker or even the commander in the field, is really to protect American national security interests at home and abroad. Now, in my opinion, the foundation of our U.S. intelligence is fundamentally sound, but we face a range of new threats from emerging great power competition. And because of that, the United States faces an expanded national security landscape of threats that are interconnected in ways we've never seen before by the rise of great power competition from China, Russia, and their allies. And the wide ar array of these threats will require our intelligence collection and analysis to adapt to a world that for nearly the last 20 years, we've been focused on defeating international terrorists. And at the same time that we have to pivot We've got a situation where the data available worldwide, which was about two zettabytes in 2010, is now about 60 zettabytes, and it's predicted to be tripled to what it is today in 2024. So the amount of information that our intelligence analysts have to exploit is phenomenally huge, which is just uh, a problem in itself. So our intelligence capabilities need to be refocused to counter global challenges to our security interests from Russia and China. And in addition, I'm sure that we can all agree that the current global pandemic has had a huge impact that no one was really properly prepared for and has demonstrated the global economic damage that can be done by this type of event all in a relatively short amount of time. And this will no doubt sharpen a focus on pandemic type events and their effect on national security. But to step back for a minute and look broadly at what the IC is focused on, I think it's useful to take a moment to talk about the National Intelligence Strategy of 2019, which was designed in 2019 to really look at the following four years. So that's where we are today. The strategy outlines three mission objectives. One, strategic intelligence, which involves assimilating a variety of information, including knowledge about political, military, diplomatic, economic and security developments to create a deep understanding of issues of concern. The second is anticipatory intelligence, which really aims to address new and emerging trends, changing conditions, and other potentially low probability but high risk developments. And the third is current operations intelligence, which supports planned and ongoing operations. Now, I think we can all agree that history informs the future, but it really doesn't define the future. And we're not going to return to an era of having a single 
major adversary like we did with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. But we can use that paradigm as a model for focusing our attention on nation state adversaries. What we need is talent, deep subject matter expertise, language requirements, and an understanding of data analysis like we've never needed before to confront the rise of great power competition. So in my view, this is what's changed dramatically. To keep pace of anticipatory intelligence issues in the IC, we're gonna need to develop ever more sophisticated quantitative methods, data analysis techniques, and tradecraft to improve our IC agency's ability to identify, analyze, and forecast changing conditions and emerging trends across a wide portfolio of issues that we know are gonna to have to be dealt with. America's analysts are also gonna to need to produce and provide information that, and products that highlight emerging trends, changing conditions, threats and opportunities that even perhaps the policy customer isn't focused on to maximize our strategic advantage. The IC has to develop integrated capabilities that will allow us to create immediate alerts both across the IC as well as with our intelligence customers to alert them to threats and opportunities for shaping policies or military decisions. Now, the IC has a significant challenge, and that is there's a very limited number of intelligence analysts with data analytics backgrounds, and the IC faces large cultural barriers to adapting new methods. Let's face it, it's a large bureaucracy, and there's a, a, an aversion to taking large risks. So in my view, without strong leadership that's gonna resist the, the fact that we need to change, um, we'll have problems. I'm convinced that we will have that leadership, but it's gonna be hard because change is hard in bureaucracies. Now, further complicating this landscape, um, as General Ashley pointed out, things like globalization are producing their own problems. Propaganda campaigns, disinformation to shape people's hearts and minds are just one example of the global nature of these challenges. Disinformation campaigns mounted by state and non-state players promoting unanticipated objectives, leveraging commercial mass media outlets, just complicate the IC's process of warning, preventing, and responding. I don't know about you, but you know, just in my daily home life, I often see people posting, quote, news on Facebook that they never even took the time to do the simplest checks for validity. We have a crisis by not applying critical thinking to what is passed off as news. And the issue of understanding what is real and what is not is complicated even for our most savvy analyst in the IC. So in my opinion, the IC to rise to the challenges associated with this great power competition, our intelligence community agencies are gonna have to address the makeup and capabilities of the current workforce, their level of knowledge and advanced analytics and the depth of understanding in things like machine learning algorithms, blockchain technology for looking at things like financial crimes and many other things, and, and the threat from quantum computing. Um, we're gonna have to be able to change the culture around innovation. And this is gonna be a big lift within the IC because as I mentioned, it's a big bureaucracy. But to continue meeting future challenges, the IC is gonna to have to drive new levels of innovation in my view with public private partnerships by proactively working with private companies, incorporating breakthrough technologies and allowing unconventional thinking and experimentation. In my view, I'm not suggesting that the IC doesn't already partner with pr private industry and academia. They do. But in my view, these partnerships have to be deepened and more broad than ever before. Innovation is taking place in the commercial world way more than it's taking place in the government. And for analysts, the environment that they find themselves in is difficult because of the need to safeguard information. Recent leaks highlight the importance of protecting sensitive information and the need to understand the insider threat while still making sure that the information is available to the analysts who need it and who need it in real time. It's a very difficult balance and sometimes the analysts can't get access to all of the information they really need for a complete and accurate judgment. Technology can help get us there with real time auditing of who gets to see the information and who gets access. So this is just something that needs to be worked. Um, for those of you who are thinking you might wanna be future intelligence analysts, 
you're going to need to be in a position to provide indications and warnings about the following key issues across the globe focused on countries and non-state actors. And these things are going to include understanding adversarial AI capabilities, understanding cyber technology, what keeps General Ashley up at night, that Internet of Things, critical to intelligence, proliferation of WMD, counterintelligence capabilities of our adversaries, blockchain-enabled technologies, bioscience and biotechnology, future telecommunication advances in 5G, which is significantly increasing the amount of data that we're gonna to have to look at, and high performance and quantum computing. Finished intelligence products delivered by analysts must bring analysis of these issues as well as many others, and harness the power of relevant data in a way that characterizes confidence in analytic assessments that includes understanding the analytic modeling underneath. This modeling has got to meet the same rigorous tradecraft standards that the, that the IC is well known for in requiring of its written analytic products. It's going to have to include things like peer review of methods and models for validity. And the IC is working on this right now. Um, before I retired in June, we were working on uh, data science tradecraft standards for across the intelligence community. These things are critical um, because there's nothing worse than a wrong data science method, right? So given this broad mandate for IC analysts, what do we have at their disposal? Well, there are a few things available. For example, we have IARPA, DARPA, and NQTEL. Um, let me, for students who may not know that, IARPA's mission is to invest in high payoff research that has the potential to provide the U.S. with an overwhelming intelligence advantage over our future adversaries. DARPA is the DI, the Defense Advanced Research Agency, and they're charged with creating breakthrough technologies and capacities for national security. And right now, more than 200 different programs are ongoing in DARPA across a spectrum of technology challenges. And NQTEL, which was started 20 years ago as the CIA Venture Capital Fund and now supports the entire intelligence community, has the purpose of searching the private sector for new commercial technology to invest in these technologies to support the entire IC's mission. The problem is that these these mechanisms are dealing with longer term problems and most analysts um, probably don't think about them on a day to day basis because they're not providing solutions for the analyst today who's sitting at their desk. So they're important for future investments, but from an analytic standpoint, no analyst is going to be looking to see what NQTEL is providing for them today. So just to summarize, in my view, data analytics is going to dominate the national security landscape as far into the future as we can possibly see. So programs like this one at UNC Charlotte are, are absolutely critical. Policymakers are going to want to see options to emerge from IC analysis that incorporate data analytics virtually in real time to address impending foreign policy challenges and opportunities. And data analytics are going to have to be applied to both open source and classified information together. There's going to be a need for IC analysts to have at least a basic understanding of data analytics, and this is going to require training of the workforce. And I know this is now ongoing in many agencies, as well as hiring data savvy analysts. And as I said before, the IC as a whole needs to increase their partnerships with the private sector for cutting edge technology and infrastructure support. We've got to rely on the innovation and technology emerging from this commercial sector and promote some sort of public private partnerships in an easy way. Before I end, I wanted to talk a minute from the policy end. Because folks in this program could equally well go into a policy role as well. And I think it's important to note that similar problems exist in the policy realm. In depth knowledge of advanced analytics and the inner workings of things like AI and ML is limited. Not only that, but as a mid-level policymaker who might be scrambling to prepare for a National Security Council meeting in the morning when principals are going to debate and decide the U.S. course of action for whatever crisis du jour is happening, their role is to write a read-ahead paper and be able to convincingly brief their principal and maybe even the National Security Council on the state of play in a particular conflict or whatever is going on. They need to have policy options based on that analysis, pros and cons of each option, and then, then likely to make a recommendation. And this particular policy analyst probably hasn't read all of the previous available work on the subject and probably isn't an expert in analytics. 
making the IC analytic reporting even more complex to understand. And while principles are very well served with things like the president's daily brief and an army of analysts and briefers, mid-level policymakers from county country directors to assistant secretaries to general officers are, are an important group for intelligence analysts to focus on. Analysts need to get to know their policy counterparts and what their needs are. And on the flip side, policy counterparts need to know where to go to find the best experts. Now, while three intelligence organizations, CIA, DIA, and INR, all produce all source intelligence, their focus and expertise reflects where they serve. For example, the Defense Intelligence Agency will focus on military and defense analysis. While service organizations focus on their specific domains, the State Department's INR shop specializes in diplomatic and political analysis, Treasury Department on financial intelligence, and CIA covers all these disciplines, but from a broader strategic perspective for senior policymakers. So all in all, a tough job for the intelligence analysts. And what's gonna distinguish the IC analysts from all the analysts in the private sector? It's going to be their ability to leverage both open source information along with classified information to provide decision advantage along with various levels of decision confidence in those judgments. And that's only going to be able to happen when the analyst has an understanding of analytic techniques and has the technology available at their fingertips to do this. So moving forward, that person who's going to be an analyst in the future needs to understand how to harness the power of big data analytics and use it for their advantage. And the IC definitely needs help with, with more folks that have these skills who can partner with subject matter experts. And finally, these analysts have to connect with the policy community to make sure they're working on the most relevant issues. I'm super excited to hear that there are so many students like you all at UNC Charlotte that are learning these skills. And I would love to talk to you later about the possibility of working in the intelligence community. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn it over to our third panelist. Thanks, Barbara. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you, UNCC. I'm very honored and excited to be a part of this conversation today. Um, so as Jim shared earlier, my name is Brad Dreyer, and I work for Bank of America uh, within our global corporate security team. So I'll be given a little bit of a, a unique perspective here, I hope, in um, kind of sharing the private sector perspective on data analytics and intel. Um, when most people think of bank security these days, their mind tends to typically go towards cybersecurity or information security, and we, we touched on that a little bit um, earlier. Um, we do have a sister team within the bank that we partner closely with uh, focused on those issues. Uh, my team looks at physical security. Um, so you can think of things along the lines of ATM crime or bank robberies, which surprisingly, yes, um, still do happen today. Um, so today I'm planning on covering a, a few things. Um, first, hopefully give you a little insight into the structure and makeup of our security team, and especially our Intel program. Um, share a couple examples with you of how we use data intelligence to drive business, business decisions um, and finally use this a little bit as a sales pitch and, and talk about some of the skills that are highly desired in the private sector um, that hopefully uh, you guys will, will gain through your education at UNCC. Um, so first, if you've seen any of um, Bank of America's commercials, uh, you might have heard us ask a question, um, which is what would you like the power to do? Um, and I imagine this is a question that's probably on the top of your mind, is, you think about your future career and um, next steps after school. Um, I can tell you for me, my answer is it's the power to protect our teammates and our clients across the globe through our strategy of being intelligence driven and prevention focused. Um, I'm very thankful at Bank of America that our senior leaders recognize the value of using intelligence to drive our business decisions. Um, and the most rewarding part of my job is knowing that the work that we do daily is directly helping keep people safe um, and allowing them to perform their jobs with peace of mind, knowing that there's a dedicated team that's watching their back and, and making sure that they're safe. So let's start by talking a little bit about that team. Um, so corporate security at Bank of America consists of multiple teams. We actually have more than 400 employees globally in our, our corporate security team. Um, I'll highlight just a few of those today. Um, so first, 
spread out globally, we have more than 100 protective services managers, which are like our local boots on the ground um, for security awareness, and then actually incident prevention and response. Um, so you can think of them along the lines of um, human intel. Um, so they're the ones providing us kind of that local flair, uh, local information of what we need to know about what a site looks like. And then there are physical um, person that can respond in the event of a security incident as well. Um, similarly, we have a life safety team as well that does the same type of work, but it's focused in supporting and minimizing any kind of health and safety risks. Uh, ultimately, at the heart of our operation is our SOAC. So SOAC stands for Security Operations and Analysis Command Center. So this is a 24-7 emergency call center um, set up at five different locations globally, available to support employees and customers um, in an emergency by monitoring any alarms um, and being able to dispatch law enforcement or alerting our local security managers of a situation. And just to give you a rough idea of kind of the volume of work that these teams handle, it's uh, about 30,000 calls a month and 30,000 alarms a month. So heavy volume of work that, that that group's handling. And as you can probably imagine too, with all of that information flowing in, into our team, it's a big inject for data collection as well for us to use from an Intel and analysis standpoint later on. Um, our Intel teams actually split out into uh, a couple different functions. So a tactical team and a strategic team. Um, so on the tactical side, similar to the, the current um, operations like Barbara described, um, we have a 24-7 watch desk, uh, again, spread out globally, that's constantly monitoring any kind of potential threats to facilities, employees, um, travelers, any major events or meetings that we might be uh, having, um, anytime we're doing campus recruiting events, anywhere that our employees may be impacted, uh, we're assessing a variety of different alerts and um, looking for any kind of potential impact or threat. And to give you an idea of the volume of, of information that's flowing in, um, anywhere from 60 to 100 different pieces of information in Intel an hour, the team's digesting and assessing for impact. Um, that can come from a variety of different sources. Um, so we leverage different intelligence speeds, which is uh, another option for um, analysts in the private sector. Um, we use open source data, and then of course our internal data as well. So like I mentioned, um, those calls that come in through our call center and then get triaged out by our security managers, um, that's additional data that we leverage um, to be able to draft and distribute near real-time communications to our key executives and decision makers um, that are able to guide what our, our business strategy and, and operation steps look like. On the strategic side, they really benefit from all of that data and information collection. Um, so they're able to use all of that um, as a component of forming their analysis. And I'll walk through kind of a couple examples um, of how we use data analytics to drive business decisions. So obviously as a business, um, we're very cost conscious and um, looking to get the biggest value um, out of uh, what we, we can and the decisions that we make. Um, an example is how we decide where we're gonna place some of our security officers. So all of that's determined um, very strategically and leveraging a variety of different data sources. Um, one being different crime mapping data, so looking at high-risk crime areas um, that we feel like it would make the most sense to place someone um, at one of our, our sites. We look at a lot of our internal security incident data. Um, I mentioned our regional security managers any kind of localized information that they have um, from site level assessments that they make on a routine, drives a threat score that we'll then put into our calculation for where we wanna place um, security guards. And then to give you a couple of recent examples in light of COVID, um, there's been uh, some additional data factors that we've considered. Um, one being the John Hopkins data around COVID exposure risk. Um, so higher COVID exposure risk um, we're looking at placing guards at some of those sites to help facilitate some of our routines around social distancing. And then from the same type of perspective as well, um, customer traffic. So looking at our internal data, 
where we have high volumes of customer traffic and where we expect to have the biggest need to help facilitate some of those safety type measures. Um, another example that I'll share is ATM crime. Um, so there's a, a emerging security threat with, in the ATM space um, around what's called hook and chain, um, which is very similar to what it sounds where a criminal will actually hook a chain to an ATM safe door, rip that off the ATM and be able to access the safe. So obviously poses a, a risk for um, a couple different reasons. One, penetration of the safe can be a, a huge cash loss. Um, but also even attempts at accessing the safe um, can damage the facade and, and cause us um, uh, financial loss in trying to repair some of those machines while also putting them out of commission for our customers to be able to use while the repairs are taking place. Um, so there's a variety of different sources that we'll use to look at how we strategically deploy mitigation um, to reduce that as a um, security uh, threat as well. Um, one being our asset data that we have internally. So the ATMs, where they're located, and the types of ATMs. Um, we actually identified some specific types of ATMs that were uh, most susceptible to this type of crime. Um, and those obviously became some of the first that we looked at focusing our mitigation around. Um, crime mapping data, again, plays a key role in driving where we focus our mitigation. Um, the internal security reports that we have uh, within our team, and then also partnerships with peer institutions and local law enforcement. Um, so there's uh, several different um, forums that we have where we're able to share information um, within peers. One of the things that's really nice um, in the security space is while um, some of our financial sector um, competitors uh, may uh, be competitors in some industries in the security space, we're commonly working together uh, because we're all interested in the same end goal. So this gives us the opportunity to data share there as well and make more informed decisions on where we place our mitigation. Um, so what that mitigation may end up looking like, variety of different um, strategic uh, deployments um, based on the areas and, and those risk factors, but everything ranging from just stickers to um, kind of have a visual deterrent to GPS tracking devices um, to modifying some of our alarms um, to be able to um, uh, prevent that type of crime. So those are a couple case examples of, of how we leverage um, data to drive some of our decisions. And, and listening to those, you can probably start to see some of the skills that are required to do this level of analysis. Um, I think some of the, the big ones that we look for are data querying and reporting skills. So experience with things like writing SQL statements, um, using SQL and Oracle databases, um, and then different reporting software platforms. Um, so SSRS, uh, Tableau, um, those types of skills are very highly sought after in the private sector industry and uh, especially by Bank of America. Um, but more than just those tech skills, um, you really need to be able to understand how to visualize and present your findings in a clear and concise way. So I know in the um, world of academia, it's very common to kind of write these long, lengthy papers explaining your findings and analysis. But in the private sector, we're really looking for bullets and one-page PowerPoint slides. So how can you con pack that information in a, a very clear and concise way um, to present it to an executive that, that may not have the time to do a lot of the, the back research, but that trusts you and your leadership uh, within your team to kind of do your due diligence um, around accuracy of, of information. So I'll wrap up kind of where I started by once again asking, you know, what would you like the power to do? Um, and if it's making a difference in, in keeping uh, others safe, there's a great opportunity for you to do that through uh, data intelligence in the private sector, um, and especially at Bank of America. Great, thanks, Brad, and thanks to our other two speakers as well. Uh, so we have a amount of time left for questions and answers, and I've gotten a, a, a large number of questions in the chat. So let me try to organize these. Um, <clears throat> first, I thought I could ask you all questions that are sort of more general about the role of data analytics and intelligence. And then um, I've grouped the second group of questions are sort of like career 
training, education type questions, which I think people can, our students especially, can really benefit from your insight on that. So first question, um, I thought this might be a good one to start with because it might make the discussion a little bit more concrete, which is, can you talk about examples of how machine learning has been integrated into the intelligence community? Like how is it actually, uh, an, ex an open source example of how it might have been used in the private or public sector to uh, help decision makers? So um, I don't know how we should organize this. If you, um, since there are only three speakers, maybe each of you could just ch chime in in turn if you have examples or ideas. Yeah, so let, let me give you an interesting one because it deals with the relationship and, and then I'm sure Barb and Brad will have some other ones to add on. Um, this is machine learning and it gets to the program called Maven. And so I would tell the students, Google Maven and Google. Uh, Maven was a program that was started under the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, which was a way to use machine learning or computer vision to classify images. In other words, so how do I know that that's a tank? How do I know that that's a piece of artillery? How do I know that that's a car? That's a person. And so the process of doing that, um, initially there was a relationship with Google um, to figure out, you know, how do we do this? And then there became a, a lot of turmoil within Google at the some of the more junior employees because they go, oh, my God, how is it you're supporting the Defense Department and you're going out and trying to kill people? Um, that has gone a long way since, but that, that's a good example of machine learning in the context of computer vision to help go through, you know, Barbara talked about zettabytes of information. Think about how much information we have in the way of imagery, geospatial kinds of information. And the, you do not have, you can never hire enough people to put eyes on all that imagery. You have to automate that process. But to be able to do that, you have to have the algorithms and the, and the computer vision through machine learning to be able to recognize those things, to pull it out. In some cases, it's going to find things the analyst can't. So really, it's taking some of those, I don't want to say mundane things, but where a machine can do that and free the analyst up, for higher levels of analysis is absolutely critical. And so things along the lines of machine learning for computer vision, just to go through geospatial data uh, to find something is a huge uh, area that the National Geospatial Agency looks at. Uh, and that's a growth industry for the IC. And I think I'll just uh, second what Bob said. I mean, the IC in general has lots of imagery to go through and um, not enough people to do that. So if we can train uh, a model to look for things that we're looking for, be it, you know, people or buildings or whatever, then that's definitely going to save time. And it's something the IC is working at. The trick with that, of course, is that you have to have tagged data and tagging data takes time. And, and there are, you know, some nifty companies that are looking at some sort of more machine augmented ways to do data tagging, but right now we're pretty much set with having to tag data ourselves and the IC is not like Google. They can't force you to, you know, click uh, stoplight every time you want to log on to your machine. It would be massive revolt. So, I mean, I think there are a lot of uh, a lot of issues that the IC has to deal with, but we're definitely using it to solve problems and some of them super interesting and I wish I could talk about them today, but I I can't get into any specifics, but trust me, there's a lot of cool applications. Yeah, and, and I would agree with Barbara. I think there's um, definitely a big opportunity there. Um, I know for us, our, our big focus is really first around data collection um, and using some of those models to drive business decisions. And let me give you one that's uh, less sensitive, you know, in the examples. Think about um, global warming. And so, in the context of imagery and change detection, if you're looking for changes in the environment that can be predictive in nature, whether you've got a catastrophe, um, you know, the ability to go through and look at change, change detection after a typhoon or something, uh, there are real world examples of how machine learning has gone into some of these, you know, third world areas and it has been able to triage where the worst impact has been where those that go in and try to do the humanitarian assistance know that this particular grid square was the worst impacted by uh, you know the typhoon or whatever or the weather by mother nature because we had pre-existing imagery we shot it afterward it did the change detection and it gave you a scale 
of where the most devastating impact was. So there's lots of applications uh, for these kinds of models. Great, thanks, Hal. That's, that's um, really interesting uh, applications. Just a follow-up question. So uh, maybe I'll use um, Bob's example of forecasting, like catastrophes or consequences of global warming. You know, if, you, if someone if uh, someone built a model that did that and tried to use it to inform, or to, you know, provide it to a policymaker so they could use it to inform their decision making, how do you, how do you explain the model to the decision maker? I mean. You know, ML models are really complex, and often the people who build it and design them don't really understand at a deep level all the moving parts that are in them. So how do you how do you just explain them? And I guess related, how can we um, build build an appropriate level of confidence in the predictive power of these models? I wonder if all have thoughts about that. I mean, let me go first on that. Um, I think that it, it would be a rare case that we would provide a model for a policymaker to use themselves. Typically, they wouldn't have time to do that kind of thing, and they would want the results of the model. But you do ask a good question about how do you um, determine confidence in that model? And that's what I was talking about in terms of the IC needing to make sure that that models that are developed are peer reviewed and, and so forth. So there's more than one set of eyes on that model because, you know, it's easy to make mistakes and you can just because you've programmed something doesn't make it right. So I think we need to be very careful about. Uh, levels of uncertainty uh, and probability surrounding our ability to predict in these models. But I, I do think it would be a rare case to provide a, a model just in, in a, an app or whatever to a policymaker. For one thing, um, models have to be checked all the time to make sure that conditions haven't changed and so forth. So it just, I don't think it would be a smart thing to do. Let me, let me add on to that because you bring up a good example of, you know, how do you train an algorithm? And in some cases, we talked a little bit about, and Barb, you know, mentioned it. You have to go and tag thousands of vehicles to be able to say, you know, that's a vehicle, or thousands of this particular model of tank to say that's a tank. So there's a lot of rigor behind that. Uh, the other part is policymakers are pretty savvy. So when you go in and the little black box said, "Well, it's this," they ask those questions. You know, unpack unpack how your technology knew that. Um, I, I can tell you the chairman and other senior leaders that I interfaced with, they were always asking questions to understand what was the technology, you know, how did you get to that point? And so we've got to be able to explain and unpack the black box. You know, it gets back to my point of transparency in the trade craft that says, I have high confidence that is fill in the blank because of the way I built and the way I trained the algorithm. Now that algorithm is conditions based toward that particular situation or something in you know specific, and let's say I'm looking at a particular piece of machinery. If I want to put another piece of machinery, then I got to retrain another algorithm to look at that. And part of what Barb alluded to is, rather than going in and having to tag yet again thousands of pictures, how do we compress that? How do we accelerate it? What could we learn from that process to speed that up? Because there are so many things uh, that we could apply this to, uh, but it's got to be able to scale. Yeah, and, and I'll just add, um, and we do something very similar in our Intel products that we um, write as well as making sure that we're defining the level of confidence that we have in our assessment and that we're clearly defining the assumptions that we're making as part of that assessment too, so that there is that level of transparency. Great, thanks. Uh, switching gears a bit, you know, um, people with data skills are in high demand. And one question we have is, how is the IC in particular working to attract people with the highest level of these skills when they face a lot of competition in the labor market from the private sector? I, I, can, I can go Put first. You on the spot there. I, go I can go first if you want. Um, so I've, I, I like this question because I've done a lot of recruiting for the agency throughout my career. And the way we attract people are, well, honestly, we don't hire a lot of senior level people because they're pretty much priced out of the uh, out of the possibility of us getting them. But we do hire a lot of entry level folks and then um, we we offer a lot of training to them. So I would say the IC really provides a, a learning kind of environment for people who want to continue their education. A uh, number of people that worked for me, you know, got master's degrees and so forth after coming to the agency. 
And I think what sells us is the mission, the supporting national security mission. I mean, if you're if your interest is in you know using your analytic background to make the most money possible, you're not going to be um, probably it's not it, we're not going to be attractive to you because you won't make the most money possible, but you're going to make enough money, right? It's not it's not terrible a terrible salary. You'll make enough, and you'll get to work on super interesting problems, and you'll get to further your education, which many companies don't can't afford to do, but we do all the time. We we make sure that our folks. Um, take training and stay current. Uh, it's a it's a high priority to the IC. So I think there are some advantages. Plus, you know, there's done something to be said for uh, working a 40 hour week and then going home because you can't do your classified work at home. So there's something kind of nice about not having your phone on at nine o'clock at night with people pinging you. Yeah, you know, Barb, the downside of that was when you're the director for the agency, they let you have all that communication at your house. So, yeah, I know, but you're special, Bob. I mean, <laughs> the, you know, the average data analyst isn't going to have that problem. Yeah, so she brings up a great point because. So, for the entry level, uh, Congress has been gracious with us and that for people that are having hard skills in the STEM side, uh, we can actually pay you more at the entry level. So there are programs if you qualify in certain data science fields, certain STEM fields that there are shortfalls that we have, we can actually bring you in at a higher pay level. Um, so it makes you more competitive. Uh, the other part Barb talked about, it is really about service to nation. And, you know, the stuff we get to do, you know, remember Tom Cruise is only an actor, right? The stuff Barb got to see over her 30 some years is the real deal. It's the real, you know, Ethan Hawks of the world and others that are out there, you know, defending the nation. Um, and then the other part is for the mid tier level, not only do you get a chance to continue your education, and we're really just on the cusp of this, and Barb may have seen some of this, but really it's it's bringing in highly qualified experts from industry for short periods of time, because we can never pay them enough to match their commercial salary, but what we can do for them, and we've seen some come in, is we can give you some really interesting challenges. And so I had a conversation with uh, a senior leader a couple of years ago, and they when they first started up the Digital Defense Service DDS outside of the Pentagon, they brought in some of these, you know, real um, uh, top tier Silicon Valley kinds of data scientists. And I said, how can we afford to bring somebody like that on? And they used the phrase, well, said he's post econ. And I said, well, I don't know what post econ is. And he goes, well, he's made so much money that right now he's just interested in solving problems for the nation. So you're going to get a chance to work with some of those industry people that from the commercial side have been, you know, brought into the Defense Department to the IC to the CIA um, that are just looking to help solve hard problems for the nation. And so it's getting exposed to all of that um, as an incentive to, to kind of bring you into the IC for a career. So I guess it's my turn to now make the private sector look just that cool as well. So, <laughs> um, so I, I think um, you both touched on one of the big pieces of this, which is um, really a, a passion for the work. Um, within the private sector, it is very much kind of a 24-7 um, type role being an Intel analyst and, you know, Monday morning, you may be asked a question about what happened um, over the weekend. So, being engaged and informed and, and having that interest in kind of current events and, and world affairs is really essential um, to the role um, because uh, it, it's, um, it's not necessarily an easy job. Um, but we do have a lot of on the job training um, that we offer as well. Um, you know, getting in the role of the private sector is probably pretty different from um, what you learn at school. So, um, getting accustomed to that kind of culture and we've had the opportunity to really build out a lot of our, our program um, internally and, and have our analysts develop those skill sets um, as the program grows. So, lots of opportunity. Great, thanks all. Um, so I know it's just about one o'clock and uh, that was our scheduled time to end the formal presentations. I think we, everyone's agreed to stick around for a little bit to answer some more student focused questions. So I'll, I'll shift to those now, but if people have to drop off, uh, thank you for um, watching and for posing your questions in the chat. So uh, shifting focus a little bit, um, maybe I could ask a little bit about how your career has developed, your careers have developed. And specifically, how do you maintain competency 
in the field when it's changing so quickly and advances are coming so rapidly. I'll defer to Barbara on that one and Brad, um, and then I'll kind of take it in from my, my position. Okay, I'll go first if you want, Brad. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting question. And I think in, in the IC, the question of remaining current is, is an interesting topic. I mean, one thing that the IC um, likes is breadth of experience. So one of the things I think that um, made me stay for 35 years, when by the way, I only expected to stay for one or two, I planned to leave when it got boring. And um, it's kind of a funny story, but I, you know, like I'm, I, I stayed for 35 years. It never got boring. I, I, it's the truth. And the reason for me is that I got to do many, many different things. I came into the IC with a PhD in mathematical statistics and I came to do analysis and I did that for several years, but then I got the opportunity to do all kinds of other things. Um, I got to go learn um, how to make, um, you know, how ballistic missiles were built and what goes into a guidance system. And so I worked on foreign missiles for many years. I spent a year overseas uh, in a war zone uh, running analysis there. I, um, you know, looked at elections. I've looked at agriculture. I've, I've just looked at so many different things from many different angles. So I would say that for myself, I did not, um, I also became a manager too. So I did not remain extremely current in my field of mathematical statistics, but I learned a lot about many, many different things. Um, and being a lifetime learner is, I think, one of the advantages of being in the IC. Now, if I had wanted to maintain um, being the sort of the CIA's expert in mathematical statistics, I could have done that. I could have stayed in the technical field and they would have been happy to send me to, you know, the latest conference every year and pay for me to take a class at George Mason or whatever I felt I needed to do to maintain my skill. But I really um, felt like for me, it was a much more interesting to learn very, very new and different things, which is what I chose to do over my career. And so let me let Brad think about it since you're a little bit younger than Barbara and I um, in terms of that scope. So she, she brings up a great point. And so let me put it in the context of what we do is a team sport. And so it really is about those deep subject matter experts. It's about those people that have a breadth of experience and our ability to bring in commercial industry through a lot of the different interfaces we have across the IC with industry helps keep that degree of currency uh, in some of the high end technical fields. And, and the more that, and it's really over the only really in the last couple of years that we've expanded that relationship with the commercial side and brought in uh, people from industry that's helping us stay more competitive. The other thing that they're looking at right now from the IC are exchange programs where you leave the government and you jump out into industry to kind of accelerate your currency because you can see what's cutting edge because industry is always going to be ahead of us. That's, that's a foregone conclusion uh, for the most part in cutting edge things, but now expanding that relationship uh, with allowing us to have exchange programs, not just bringing them in. Uh, but it's interesting when you think about it in terms of, you know, it really is a team sport. If you've never read the book Range by David Epstein, uh, grab it. It's a great read. Brad, over to you. Yeah. Um, so I think I have a fairly interesting kind of career path story, which I, I think is actually pretty similar to um, a lot of our, our current teammates um, within the corporate security program at the bank which is um, I did not come from the Intel community. I didn't um, go to school specifically for that. I actually went to UNC for biology, um, somehow ended up in the security world um, and really identified some opportunities to improve some of our internal processes. Um, so it was being granted the opportunity to um, kind of learn on the job and take a chance to try and improve some things. So, Specifically, um, when I joined uh, the role in, in our Intel team, um, there was a big opportunity to clean up how our data was structured. Um, we really didn't have very solid systems of record. Um, and I actually did Google research, on the job research, um, to learn more about how to build out databases, how to collect data, 
and how to start automating some of our reporting that we could use for analysis just through itself. Um, so that was 10 or so years ago. And um, from there, our programs continue to grow um, and, and evolve with the latest technology. So a lot of really on the job learning um, has been kind of how I've, uh, how I've grown and um, just there's the opportunity for all kinds of uh, diverse backgrounds and experiences that we look for when hiring people. Great, very interesting. Sort of as a follow-up question, how do you all see the skills that you need to succeed in government uh, versus the private sector, both overlapping and differing from each other? I don't know who would want to, anyone have any thoughts or want to take, jump in and take that first? Yeah, you know, having not been in the private sector and spent the last 36 years on the government <laughs> side. Um, I, I, so this would be um, supposition at best. I think they're the same skills. I think the same skills that make you successful, whether it's on the government or the you know commercial side. And if somebody were to ask the question, which I'm surprised has it come out, one of the, one of the fundamental questions people always ask is, so what are the skills you're looking for in an analyst in the IC? Lifelong learner, Barbara already said it. And the other one I would say that you just have a natural inquisitive nature. You're always digging. When somebody says, you know, the sky's blue, you're like, well, why is the sky blue? So help me understand, let's unpack that, let's, you know. And so that inquisitive nature uh, of always digging, learning, and being a lifelong learner is, you know, I think that is on both sides of the house. I often use uh, an example of when I was a Lieutenant Colonel. So think 17, 18 years in the military and I'm getting ready to command a battalion. So that's about six, 700 soldiers. And we had a, a general officer kind of look at us all and go, where you are as a leader, you're about a 75% solution. You'll spend the rest of your life on the last 25%. So whether you're, you know, been at it for maybe 10 years or so as Brad has, or like Barbara and I, you know, 35 years plus, it's that realizing that you're always a work in progress. You're always learning. You're always adding to your kit bag of what you understand and what you know. And then I always close that story thinking about General Mattis. And I go, he's probably at the 99.9% uh, solution where he has, you know, as a leader, but he's gonna get up tomorrow morning realizing he's a work in progress and there's more to learn, there's more to do. You know, I spent this morning having a good conversation with the uh, HR McMaster about how he plugs in and keeps his situation awareness, you know, now that he's out of uniform, out of the, the National Security Advisor job, and we talked about where he goes to get information. And that's just a good example of it. it's that inquisitive nature in realizing you're a lifelong learner is, is I think that is an underpinning of success, uh, both on the commercial and the military side. I mean, I can just, I second everything that General Ashley said. I, I would also say that um, I do think that the skills are very similar. I mean, in private industry, which I've been now working with for the last four months, so 35 years or just four months, I'm not gonna say I have a lot of experience, but I will say that, um, you know, things like good communication skills, both written and verbal, uh, good teamwork skills in the IC, um, everything is a team. You're not gonna do anything by yourself. And in private industry, you're working with teams as well, whether it's with your own team group or with customers. So, you know, just that along with, you know, the curiosity to be able to solve problems, whether they're industry problems or government problems, and I think most important, um, rather than thinking about the skills that we need, be the IC or uh, commercial, uh, commercial business, you need to think about what your passion is. Because if you students don't follow what's passionate to you, it won't be exciting, you know? So it wouldn't be a good career for you to go into intelligence if you just don't have any interest in, in foreign affairs, that's not your thing. Um, so you have to pick something that's passionate for you and that, that will help make you be good at it. So I, I completely agree. Um, really think the skills are the same there. Um, one of the things that I always ask, so if anyone ever um, interviews with me, one of the questions I always ask is, um, what do you think some of the top physical security threats are that face Bank of America? Um, and ultimately what I'm after with that question is to understand where the candidate um, is at from a knowledge of world events, current, current events, what's going on, and how that could potentially lead to 
um, those downward thrusts that the bank faces. Um, and that comes with an interest in the subject matter. Um, if you're not naturally interested in, in that, that world, um, you're probably not going to be able to answer that off the top of your head. Um, but if you have a passion in, in being in the know and, and learning things, and, um, then, then that should be something that you can quickly come up with an answer for. Hey, let, if I could, let me just go back and foot stomp Barb's points on uh, written and communication skills. Because that's that's the that's what people see of you, and that's how they digest, and that's how they evaluate you. That's going to be foremost in any interview that you do. And you know, having worked now for the past three years with the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is seventy five percent civilian, one of the things they have to do every year is they've got to put together this performance assessment form. And this performance assessment form is their ability to articulate where they've been impactful. And some of the frustration with some of those officers are, well, I'm a little frustrated that, you know, I have to participate in this writing contest. And my feedback to them is life's a writing contest. It's not just about putting together that assessment form to show your value added. And oh, by the way, like any paper that you do in college, you know, shame on you if you ever turn anything in that you didn't get somebody to read and proof it for you, right? So you could do that with this. But really your communicative skills uh, and your written ability is a lifelong skill and potential employers in the IC on the commercial side, boy, they're going to be looking at that because they're going to size up your ability to do both of those things. They may ask you for a written product and it's going to come out in spades in your interview. Thanks. I hope we have time for to answer just a couple more questions. The next one is from a student who writes, I'm getting an undergraduate degree in statistics and minor in data science. What are the types of careers in the intelligence community that would be available to me? And should I get a master's degree? Um, and uh, before before I turn this over to y'all, I just uh, let me do a little bit of um, advertising myself. So I think I mentioned that I run the Intelligence Community Center of Academic Excellence here at UNC Charlotte. We now have a minor in security and intelligence studies uh, that includes specific classes on things like writing and briefing and the history of intelligence and intelligence community. Um, and this uh, minor is open to students from any from across the university. So we're particularly interested in touching base with students in uh, data science and more technical fields because this might be a nice way for them to bring both their technical skills to bear in um, in figuring out how to how to forward their career in the intelligence community. But I will stop there and, and turn it over to the three of you if you want to address the question about the types of careers that would be open to people with a background in data science or related fields? I can go first. Um, since my last job was sort of, was running data science for CIA, I know that pretty well, at least for the CIA. So as a, with an undergraduate degree in statistics and a minor in data science, you could um, easily apply to be a data scientist at CIA. You'd be an entry level data scientist, but that, like I mentioned before, that's not a problem. Um, and if we brought you in, what would happen is first thing we do is put you through four months of training um, of our own training to make sure that you've got the programming skills that we need. You've got the background in modeling and that you know where to find our data and where our set of tools are and how to use our compute platform so that you can be successful. And then what would happen with us is that you would go on a couple of rotations to various mission centers that use data scientists. Currently, we have data science teams in every mission center and every directorate at CIA. So you would go and spend four months in uh, maybe in the Iran mission center, and then maybe spend your second four months in uh, working China or something else. And then at the end of that, you would, at the end of your first year, you would select your first full-time assignment. Um, so you, I don't think you would need to feel that you don't have the skills to jump right in. You certainly do, and we hire a lot of people with um, skills like that. And I've not recruited for DIA, but I do believe that they're hiring the same skill set and the same thing with NGA and most of and the ODNI as well. I personally think that CIA is the best place to work as a data scientist, but I know I'm biased. So. Um, yeah, you definitely have the skills to do that. If you're interested in, for example, in doing a lot of writing, um, in addition to using some analytic skills, you could apply for the job that's called analytic methodologist. And I know that at least NGA and CIA have those positions and they're primarily in the directorate of analysis, which is the directorate that writes and briefs the policy community. 
Um, so there are, there are a number of jobs that you could apply for with a, just the degree that you mentioned. Yeah, so Barb, we do have the same programs. It's a very similar parallels, just uh, depending on the agency. And um, I am a big CIA fan, but you know, I haven't worked with you guys for so long in, in so many different countries downrange. But it is, it's very similar, whether it's CIA, whether it's NGA, whether it's DA or NSA. Um, or So it's it's really integrating the data scientists with the analysts. One of the things we do are uh, analytic data teams where you have methodologists that go out and then you look at what's the problem you're trying to solve. And some of those are analytic problems or big data problems. But it's, you know, and the other part when we talk about a degree of data science literacy, for the all source analyst who's not a hardcore data science, we want them to get some basic understanding so they can ask informed questions. And so when you go back to my initial comments on the national defense strategy, the first thing that a senior leader might ask you is what's the problem we're trying to solve? And so that's where the data scientist, you know, kind of comes in with the analyst. What's the problem you're trying to solve? Because the way the IC is being structured now, you know, it used to be we would buy a box or a capability and it's like Microsoft Office, right? Whatever came with Word is the functionality you get with Word. What we need to be able to do is agile enough to have an analyst look at the data science go, you know, if Word would allow me to actually do this, and so and go, okay, get out of it, get out of the seat, sits down, writes down the script and goes, okay, well, you can do that now. That's the kind of dynamic relationship we need with data science and solving problems in real time with our analysts. And those are the kind of opportunities across the IC uh, that you'll have a, a chance to do. So there's all kinds of places you can plug in with fellow data scientists, with all source analysts, and just business processes. You know, how do I look at, how do I look at the metrics of onboarding people, why they left, you know, you know, look at the demographics of hiring, you know, and, and where are trends, you know, in terms of how do I bring in a certain demographic, more women in the workforce, more minor, minorities, things like that. There's a multitude, you know, that, that data science can be put against problems uh, across these large agencies that they have to solve on a daily basis. So similarly on the, the private sector side, there's plenty of opportunities for data scientist roles within the bank. Um, making business decisions along the lines of kind of our consumer re retail space, for example, um, physical security, uh, of course, and then um, information security are, are key areas where those skill sets um, come into play. Um, I will also do kind of a, a plug for Bank of America around um, our tuition reimbursement. Um, so if you are interested in continuing education, um, there is the opportunity to, to get that as a bank employee too. And I know there's other companies that provide similar opportunities too. Thanks, that's an interesting set of perspectives. Um, maybe we can wrap up with this last question, which is sort of forward looking. Um, so this is from a student who said, writes, as a freshman in college, what, how do you recommend we stay updated? Or really, what are the future trends within data science and data analytics? Okay, I'll go first. Um, so I think as a freshman in college that you don't need to worry about the latest trends in data science. What you need to, to worry about is getting a good foundation of um, core skills, like we talked about, like General Ashley and I mentioned. You need to hone your writing and communicating skills, hone your teamwork skills, and get a basis of good um, you know, analytic skills, a good foundation of statistics, a good foundation of modeling, a good foundation of learning how to uh, code and program, and it doesn't really matter what you know computer language you you decide to become proficient in, because that's a transferable skill. But you need to make sure that you've got the basic set, and then later on, um, it's much later on the problem that you need to worry about what are the latest trends. Worry about the the baseline at first. Yeah, I was going to say, make sure your grades are uh, you're at the 4.0 level and you're competitive, and and you know the 25 meter target that's in, that's in front of you, which is completing your program, doing well, because that. That's the competitiveness uh, that's going to be out there. So when the IC is looking at you, they're going to look at what you study, what your skills are, uh, do you have practical experience, what was your GPA, things like that. Uh, so all of that factors in. Um, so don't get too far down the road uh, that you lose sight on some of the near term things that you got to do. And the other thing is, and uh, I'll defer to, to Barbara, but I know within um, DA, NSA, and NGA, we have a pretty robust internship program. 
And what we do is we bring interns in in the summer. What we'll do is we'll start talking to you because you do the applications around this time of year so that we can get you cleared to come in in the summer. And we bring in for several months where we'll put you in different areas and get exposed to things within either DIA or NGA or NSA. They all have internship programs. And that really makes you more competitive years down the road once you get grad, once you get to uh, you know, the point you finish your bachelor's degree or your master's degree. Um, if there's something you saw in a particular agency that's of interest to you. Um, so it just makes you more competitive to, to do that. So I tell you, go, go look at uh, NGA and DI and NSA's website. CIA may have it as well for an internship program. Yeah, I'll just add that CIA has the exact same thing. And CIA typically likes you to come for two summers. Uh, in fact, DIA may like that as well because it takes time and money to get you cleared to be able to come in because on none of these agencies will put you on make work. You're going to work on real intelligence problems just as if you were a full time employee. You're not moving papers or faxing. You're working on real intelligence problems and you get a real chance to see if you like the work or not. So it's a great way to go. Yeah, I, I completely agree with, with everything that's um, been said already. Um, focus on those fundamentals. Um, I think one of the uniqueness um, that often surprises people that come from public to pri private sector is um, the speed expectations. Um, so something to be prepared of, but there's um, expectation of very quick turnaround times too for deliverables too. So it is a high paced, um, high pressure environment. Um, so just being aware of that and, and knowing what you might be getting into. Okay, great. Well, um, let's move towards wrapping up. I'll give Doug a chance to say a couple words if he'd like to in a second, but I would like to just um, thank everybody for asking questions. We had far more many far more questions than we were able to address today. Um, feel free to follow up with me if you'd like more information about the program that I mentioned. I put a, a, an advertisement in the chat about that. Um, mostly though, I'd like to thank our three panelists uh, for taking time out of their busy day to share with us their ideas uh, and answer everybody's questions. So thank you to the three of you. Doug, did you want to um, say anything in terms of wrapping up? Sure, I, I do. And so thank you, uh, General Ashley, Dr. Stevens, and, and uh, Mr. Dreyer. Really appreciate your, your thoughts and, and guidance to, to our students and, and uh, just information about the intelligence community. And, and Jane, Jim has the, Dr. Walsh has the program, so hopefully we can feed some students into those programs. And we also have the new bachelor's degree in data science. So as people are interested and students want to go that, that's a great way at where you do get those foundation. And really, we teach you to learn and you have that curiosity and you will continue to have that lifelong learning is the key. But uh, thank you all. Uh, appreciate your time today. And thanks for all of our attendees uh, to come in and, and uh, UNC Charlotte School of Data Science. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. So appreciate it.